Hello and welcome to Temple Street, the show brought to you by the Department of Communication and Journalism at Suffolk University. I'm Ashley Proctor. I'm Siobhan Sullivan. And I'm Ryan Chevalier. On today's show, we will report on what I'm sure many Bostonians are sick of looking at, snow talk about the safety issues surrounding the popular cab company Uber, and learn about the Creating Change Conference in Denver, Colorado. Later, we will report on the recent city plans to inspect potentially unsafe student apartments, hear people on the street weigh in on the ongoing controversy involving vaccinating children, and find out exactly what is going on with the deflate gate drama. We will end, as always, with our critic at large, Siobhan Sullivan. Siobhan, what do you have for us today? Well, Ashley, today I'm going to be talking about what I think is the best part of Hollywood's award season. Thanks, Siobhan. I can't wait to hear about that. But first, we have more on our top story, the New England record-breaking snow. The unprecedented amounts of snowfall this winter have brought public transportation to a standstill. With snow totaling nearly five feet, people say it is ch still challenging to navigate the city. Temple Street reporters Lauren McGaughy, Savannah Mediano, and Lola Santiago have more on how frustrated Bostonians are dealing with the snow. Boston is experiencing one of its snowiest winters ever. The record-setting snowfall has caused the MBTA to completely shut down twice, while service has remained severely limited throughout the city. In addition to being tortured by the freezing temperatures, people say they are especially aggravated by the never-ending commute. Transportation is obviously the main thing. I can't blame the MBTA drivers, but I can definitely um, blame administration for a lack of communication. With the snow blocking pathways and roads, people are getting creative with other ways to get around, as well as protecting their parking spots. People having to watch out and duck for the snow and icicles coming off of the buildings because yeah. they're everywhere. Taxis are costing more. Uber is killing me! Spot. You know when people put something in their spot, that's their spot. And they, they put in the hours to shovel it So in Dorchester they don't play around like that. With all the snow and ice, people are continuing to shovel completely covered sidewalks and roofs. But despite snow removal crews working around the clock, the remaining unplowed streets are still delaying annoyed residents trying to get to work. Definitely been interesting, um, especially with the um, tea being shut down. There's been um, probably two or three nights now that I've had to actually stay overnight here at the hostel to work my shifts the next day. Um, so it's it's been a struggle. I have not plowed our street, so we're walking in the middle of the street on top of snow, and then at the corner of our street, snow banks, and it's just ridiculous. So you either get trying to get hit by a car or you're trying to get out the way. The Boston City Administration has spent an estimated $35 million on snow removal so far, nearly double its budget. Governor Charlie Baker is waiting for President Obama's approval on aid that would help cities and towns with snow cleanup costs. For Temple Street, I'm Laura McGahey with Savannah Mediano and Lola Santiago. On the bright side, soon we can replace our shovels with shorts, as spring is officially only 22 days away. An increase in assault allegations against the car for hire service Uber has local users concerned with their safety. After receiving immediate popularity in more than 200 cities following its launch in 2010, the t company sets its sights on mid sized cities, including Boston. Now the service is facing new hurdles. Shauna Newcomb and Rachel Wardwell have more on the story. The new ride-sharing service Uber is the subject of ongoing investigations, claiming the service engages in unfair business and compromises safety. According to the Herald Sun, Uber is dangerous, unsupervised, and illegal. However, that's not an opinion shared by all. Yeah, that doesn't stop me at all because from my experience, I use Uber a lot and I talk to all my Uber, Uber drivers. They seem really nice. Although many users say Uber is more convenient, the company now faces a significant drop in popularity, with 13 lawsuits, including two currently pending in Boston. But despite the increase in these alleged assaults, many still see a bright future for the ride-sharing service. Legal scholar and Suffolk law professor Janice Griffith says Uber can overcome their legal obstacles. It is possible that Uber could regulate or, or more strictly uh, research the backgrounds of its drivers to lessen the occurrence of such kind of events. With the MBTA still running on a modified schedule following the recent snowstorms, Boston commuters are turning to the cheaper alternative Uber, despite its legal controversy. Part-time Uber driver Marjorie McHugh shares her insight on the company's credibility. I think some of those allegations may be 
just over exaggerated but if it does happen you know there's always a risk to everything as long as they're respectful to me and I'm respectful to them it usually all works out well in a statement to the general public safety uber spokeswoman Evelyn Tay says safety is their number one priority and will enforce layers of safeguards with ETA sharing to ensure accountability and traceability for Temple Street I'm Shauna Newcomb with Rachel Wardwell I haven't used Uber myself, but it sounds like more regulation could be a good thing. In an effort to raise awareness about LGBTQ equality, nearly 4,000 people gathered to attend the Creating Change Conference in Denver, Denver, Colorado. Temple Street reporter Crystal Chandler joined a group of Suffolk students to bring us the story on the empowering messages and a powerful protest. The 27th Annual Creating Change Conference, hosted by the National LGBTQ Task Force, brought people from all over the country together for a week of more than 300 workshops addressing issues facing the LGBTQ communities. But this year, during the opening ceremony, something powerful happened. <laughs> Members of the Latino community and their allies stormed the stage to protest the brutality against queer people of color but specifically Jessica Hernandez, a 17-year-old queer youth who was killed by Denver police just one week before the conference began. Jesse is not the first queer gender non-conforming person of color whose life has been taken. Less than two months into 2015, seven trans women have already been killed. And according to the National Coalition of Anti-Violence Programs, transgender women of color account for 53% of all anti-LGBTQ homicides, a statistic that prompted the hashtag Trans Lives Matter on social media. Throughout the conference, members of the transgender community continued to take the stage to share their messages of empowerment and personal experience, including Eunice Coldman, a minister at Rivers of Living Water Church in New York, and a proud transgender man who sent a heartfelt message of gratitude to the youth in the movement. Thank you, because what you're doing, it isn't only just for your life, it's for mine. As the conference came to an end, Reverend Coldman wanted people to know one last thing about the transgender community. We are human beings. We have a right to life like anyone else created by God. And yes, and I'm looking in the camera, we are created by God. I don't question why I am the way I am. I just am. For Temple Street, I'm Crystal Chandler. Diversity peer educators are planning a campus-wide campaign to raise awareness about the Trans Lives Matter movement. For more information, you can contact the Office of Diversity Services. A BU student's death caused by a three-alarm fire in an attic apartment has sparked a citywide investigation. Katie Martineau and I have more details on what inspectors are doing to make sure student living conditions are safe. With more than 45,000 undergrad and grad students living in off-campus apartments, Boston Inspectional Services are finding that landlords are dropping the ball when it comes to maintaining their properties. I mean, I live in a basement apartment and I'm terrified of there being a fire because I only have one exit. To make sure that landlords are complying with housing codes, starting in the month of March, 580 student apartments will be inspected for zoning and safety violations. Students are entitled to good living environment. They're entitled to heat running hot water, smoke detectors, heat detectors, proper means of getting out of the building in the event they have to. Along with these violations, inspectors will also be looking for more than four undergraduates living in one apartment, which infringes upon the zoning regulations. They advertised this apartment as a two-bedroom. When we came to look at it, there was like at least five beds in the apartment. If too many students are found living together, the city wants you to know that you will have time to relocate if the living conditions are not dangerous. The reason we're doing this is to create a good environment for all the students to live so that your living experience should not hinder your educational experience here in Boston. Mayor Marty Walsh is adamant that everyone has a minimal standard of living, so if you hear a knock on the door, don't panic. The city is here to work with you. For Temple Street, I'm Katie Martineau. Christopher Williams says students shouldn't hesitate to contact inspectional services if they face unresolved issues with their apartments. Despite the New England Patriots winning their first championship in a decade, negative media coverage around Deflategate still lingers. Jeremy Hayes and I have more on the ongoing scandal.
It's all thumbs up for the Patriots as they celebrate their championship win in Boston. The Patriots have heard accusations of underinflating footballs in their AFC title game against the Indianapolis Colts, which led to Roger Goodell announcing the NFL would investigate this deflate gate case. The sports media is continuing to cover the speculations. I think it's just a media story, a little bit overblown. Um, they kind of wasted a lot of time. You no, know, from from Coach Belichick's point of view, you know, you're preparing for a Super Bowl, and and you're worried so much now about this Deflate Gate stuff. I think that's got to be pretty frustrating. I think it's never gonna go away because they won now, and it's like. What if they didn't deflate the balls? Suffolk University's Dr. Bob Rosenthal teaches courses in media and popular culture. He has been an avid Patriots fan all his life. The media coverage was very exaggerated. It led on the major newscasts three or four nights during the week leading up to the Super Bowl. It's just absolutely an insane amount of coverage as if nothing else happened in the world except some underinflated footballs. I just didn't believe what Tom Brady had to say. You have to do the time. Mm -hmm. You are then a known felon. And how come it can't be a misdemeanor? The reaction to it is so over the top. The the, the, the nation's preoccupation okay, with the, the, the underinflation. My guess is is that you know it's an educated guess that this was a big story over absolutely nothing. Patriots owner Robert Kraft says if the NFL finds nothing, they owe the team an apology. For Temple Street, I'm Jeremy Hayes reporting with Ryan Chevalier. Roger Goodell and the NFL have made no public timetable for when the Deflategate investigation outcome will be announced. With over 700 cases of measles in the past three months, people are weighing the pros and cons of getting their children vaccinated. We have Kaya Dunn on the street getting the Boston perspective. Do you think that it should be mandatory for children to get vaccinated? Well, you know, when I was a kid, they vaccinated all of us. So I just thought it would be common sense to vaccinate. You know, now we're having a problem because I guess some people don't vaccinate. I do think that. Because it's a health issue and it's a public safety. And if you know that other children may be in danger because some are not vaccinated, I think that that's why it should be the law. I think they should be if they plan on attending public schools with other children. If they don't want to be vaccinated, I think they they should not be allowed in public schools then because of the danger they pose to the others. I do feel that vaccinations are definitely up to a person's choice, so I don't think that it should be mandatory. I know that some people do like to find uh, different paths away from medicine, so I think that it should definitely be up to the parents. I haven't personally found any read any credible evidence that the vaccine is harmful. Um, Everything I read (laughs) seems to be on the fringe in that area. I don't believe in vaccination, Um, but for myself personally, but I could see how they would have to control it publicly for other people being exposed in close quarters. So it's a tough question, but I guess for the good of kind of the the masses, it would probably have to be controlled. You know, Ryan, I honestly can't believe that measles still exists in today's day and age. Personally, I think that, you know, all parents should vaccinate their children to keep everyone around them safe. I agree. Parents today, they should definitely vaccinate their kids in this day and age with science and health. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere. We will be right back after a short commercial break with the chair of the psychology department, Gary Fireman, who talks about the effects of bullying. We will also learn about a special project involving alternative spring break, review Suffolk's production of the musical Spring Awakening, and get Siobhan's take on Hollywood's award season. It's a beautiful day out here, sunny today with light breezes, giving way to clouds in the afternoon. We could see some light precipitation to moderate precipitation later on, followed by powerful storm-like conditions. 90 miles per hour winds are expected. Authorities are asking everyone, stay indoors. Come on, that's it, let's go. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds.
Temple Street reporter Dior Serra recently sat down with Gary Fireman, chair of the psychology department, to talk about how bullying is affecting growing numbers of students and communities across the United States and what we can do about it. Hello, today I'm here with Gary Fireman, chair of the psychology department of Suffolk University and who conducts research on bullying. Hi Gary, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Good, thank you for joining me today. So, um, in a recent interview, you had said, either as a bully, victim, or bystander, we all experience some personal, um, we all have some personal experience with bullying. I myself have experienced all three. Um, now, with that, over 3.2 million students um, are being bullied each year. Where, as a society, are we going wrong? That's a good question, and I don't know if the way to frame it, though, is that we're actually going wrong. I think the way to frame it is that this is a problem that everyone encounters. It's part of what we all experience growing up. Teasing, which can turn into something more severe like bullying. And bullying, whether you're a bully, whether you're a victim, what's called a bully victim, who's been both bully and victim, or someone that knows someone who's been in that situation or has witnessed it, uh, it's just something that's so prevalent that we all have some experience with it and have all thought about it. What age do you necessarily find bullying will start? Well, in terms of bullying, it has to be the intentional harm is one of the things. You're intentionally being aggressive, intentionally mm -hmm. being aggressive towards someone else. Yep. And little babies, even if they're aggressive, aren't intending sometimes to take someone's toy or something like that. They just are interested in the toy. So. Really, folks think of bullying as starting around, and I'm being approximate here, around age five. Do you feel that social media doesn't, um, such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, do you feel as if they don't really do anything to help this situation? Do you feel that there's something they could do with their sites that could prevent bullying, cyberbullying? That's an excellent question, and I think in a complex one. I think that bullying occurs online way too much. I think uh, bullying online presents unique challenges because after all, much of it isn't happening in the school. So is the school even responsible mm -hmm. for taking uh, the initiative with online bullying, which is maybe happening in the home? Um, what social media can do and Facebook can do to oversee these types of things um, is a question that's beyond uh, my understanding of the skills and technology that they have. I imagine certain serious overt threats they can identify, mm -hmm. but much bullying is spreading rumors. How are they to know what is that type of bullying? So I think it's a tough one. Do you find that cyber victims of cyber bullying are more suicidal than cyber free uh, victims? Well that's a big one in terms of more suicidal. Let me step back a little yeah. and talk about uh, the difference between what you refer to as cyber bullying yep. or is often referred to as electronic bullying mm -hmm. and that's bullying that can happen in multiple formats through electronic and social media. So Facebook, Twitter, but can also happen through cell phones and, and texting. One of the uh, unique things about online uh, in electronic bullying is it can happen and, and go with you all the way to your home and into your bedroom. Yeah. So you're on your computer at home in what used to be a safe place and a safe environment and actually can experience being bullied or actively bully someone else. The other distinct characteristic about electronic bullying is once something's out there, say an embarrassing photo or a threatening statement, it's on the electronic media for as long as you want to look at it. It's not like a general statement that you can remember, but not re-experience and re-see repeatedly. And so it's really uh, mixed results so far. There are some differences and there are some similarities in the sense that it hurts either way. Over the course of your research, um, has anything changed for the better with bullying? I think one of the things that has been very beneficial is the media has spent more time attending to this, bringing it to the attention of, to the public so that more people are aware of it. I think that the legislature has passed laws to require bully intervention and prevention programs to occur in the schools. This is new since I've started research, which is another 
big positive. I think that the Centers for Disease Control, recognizing that bullying is a, is a health risk, mm -hmm. uh, has been a great advancement, and they're putting research dollars in helping us understand the how bullying occurs, when it occurs, and also th for understanding why it occurs. Those sorts of things have been great changes uh, over the past uh, 20 some odd years since I started researching this. If you had the opportunity to give one strong statement worldwide that everyone would hear um, on, on the topic of bullying, what would you say? What I would say is since we've all uh, experience some realm in some realm bullying and the majority of us the vast majority of us appreciate that bullying is painful and hurtful my one statement would be then to get involved one of the things that helps victims of bullying s tremendously is to know that they're not alone to know that there are peers out there friends out there that support them and provide safety for them. So getting involved in a positive way would make a huge difference. Well, thank you, Gary, for um, joining me today. And uh, it was a great interview. Uh, back to you in the studio. If you or anyone you know is being bullied, you can seek more information at bullying.org. The Center for Community Engagement at Suffolk University offers students a range of possibilities to give to volunteer and give back to the community. Temple Street reporter Lara Ruiz takes us to the most recent alternative winter break trip to El Salvador and explains the benefits of volunteering. Suffolk students traveled to El Salvador to work with Habitat for Humanity during their winter break. Students worked for a week clearing up debris and breaking ground in the foundation to help rebuild the home destroyed by Hurricane Sam back in 2005. Alternative winter break focuses on El Salvador. Our students take a semester-long course in the fall studying El Salvador, the Civil War period, get the opportunity to, to experience that history firsthand um, by interacting with people in El Salvador, hearing their stories, seeing the places that we talk about in class, um, and then also through service. El Salvador continues to struggle with high rates of poverty, inequality, and crime since the Civil War. More than 75,000 people were killed during the conflict. During the trip, students are able to visit Monsignor Romero's home, a Catholic bishop that was assassinated for speaking out against social injustice and the site where six Jesuit priests were murdered. On Monday is when we started really working and is, what, is where we all felt was the reason why we applied to be on this trip and why we actually came. The fact that we are, we're building a home for one family means that one family has a roof over their head and has been able to witness people from other parts of the world coming and caring, like putting all of their energy and efforts into them. Um, so I think for the family that means so much to have people just be really concerned and really care about them. Sofia Bolaños, the field assistant from El Salvador, explains how in addition to volunteering, alternative winter break is an unforgettable opportunity where students and staff make long-lasting connections for a better future. Básicamente, voluntariado es aprender a valorar lo que tenés y compartirlo. No es solo venir y, y construir casa de voluntariado, es ser parte de algo grande y creérselo. For Temple Street, I'm Laura Ruiz. Applications for alternative spring break trips are available in September, and applications for the alternative winter break trip to El Salvador are available in March. No subject matter was off limits in Suffolk's production of the musical Spring Awakening. With songs about sex, abortion, and child abuse, the cast hopes the risque show took the spotlight off of them and on to some important issues. Temple Street reporter Olivia Powers shares with us how students were able to get audiences talking about more than just the school musical. Despite controversial undertones, the Performing Arts Office presented Spring Awakening in an effort to enlighten audiences of real-life adolescent struggles. It's the story of, I guess, I'd say, the transition between being a child and being an adult, and that really confusing time where you think you know everything, but you don't know everything. Students served as cast and crew for the rock musical, which also featured a live band. 
but it was not perfecting lines or fitting costumes that was the biggest obstacle for the troupe. The snow has been the hardest aspect. Um, just we've lost a lot of rehearsal time, um, but we have such a like strong crew of students. Freshman Kevin Fabrizio wanted audiences to know the show's content might not be what they're expecting. You know the issues of sex not being discussed, depression, suicide, um, corporal punishment, child abuse. It's all still here in society. Spring Awakening also illustrated how teenagers cope with homosexuality, the moral dilemma of abortion, and the death of friends. The actors were committed to portraying the issues sincerely, adding they hoped that their comfort level would also invite viewers to have some awakenings of their own. I hope the audience realize that bringing up these taboo, taboo subjects as our society deems it, I hope they realize it's just a part of who we are and that it's okay to talk about this stuff. Audience members, including therapists from the Counseling Center, stayed after the show to continue the conversation with the cast. During the talkback session, some expressed that they felt the cast was able to bring forth issues for those who cannot. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I think it also touched the, the audience, because the audience, as some of the people said during the talkback, everybody's gone through some of these things. And even For Temple Street, I'm Olivia Powers. The cast is hoping that audience members will continue to discuss the issues within the show long after the final curtain. Every year we see movies that make us laugh, hear songs that make us cry, and watch celebrities get awards that are usually well deserved. Our critic at large, Siobhan, is here with us on this year's award season. Siobhan? As February comes to an end, so does award season and the hopes and dreams of millions of people who realize they'll never be as rich or famous as Hollywood's elite. But to me, it's not about the awards, the jokes made by the hosts, or even the fashion, though some of those dresses would look fabulous on me, just saying. You see, my favorite part of award season is visualizing celebrities as actual humans, albeit richer and better looking than most. What do I mean by human? I mean there's two types of celebrities. Those who are grateful for what they have and accept their awards graciously, and those named Kanye West. I think the whole idea of award shows are great. We congratulate people we don't even know, celebrate movies we probably haven't seen yet, and I think most important of all, we recognize white men. Shout out to the Oscars. After the Oscar nominations were announced in early January, people were really upset. It seems that those who were snubbed by the Academy were either A, female, or B, not white. Angelina Jolie and Ava DuVernay were both snubbed for Best Director, and DuVernay's film Selma was snubbed altogether, though it did win Best Original Song for Glory, which if you haven't heard, is phenomenal. But although there was a lack of diversity in the nominations, two really great things happened at the Oscars. Patricia Arquette won Best Supporting Actress for her role in Boyhood and used her acceptance speech to advocate for equal pay for women. And Mexican filmmaker Alejandro González Iñárritu took home three major awards, Best Director, Best Picture, and Best Original Screenplay for his film Birdman, giving bigots another reason to complain. Englishman Eddie Redmayne won Best Actor and couldn't contain his excitement. Unfortunately, a male couldn't win Best Actress, so Julianne Moore accepted the award. One of the best moments of the Oscars, though, Lady Gaga showcasing her classically trained voice. The pop divas tribute to Julie Andrews and The Sound of Music was one of my favorite things. I like the celebrities like Eni Rito, like Moore, and like Arquette, who you can tell are really, truly genuine. You don't see that at every award show. Take the Grammys, for example. Eminem won Best Rap Album, but was not there to accept his award. Kanye West did not win Album of the Year, so instead tried to ruin the moment for Beck, who did win. In all actuality, West was not nominated. He just thought Beyonce should have won. I think he needs to remember who he's married to, and that is not Queen B. All in all, award season is great. Live interviews can show the awkward side of celebs, and the fashion, like I said, is impeccable. But if I were to take away one thing, sometimes award season reminds me I'm lucky to be a nobody, because as Hannah Montana once said, nobody is perfect, therefore, I am perfect. You know, Siobhan, you're totally right. Why be famous when you can be perfect? <laughs> My thoughts exactly. I think Kanye West is perfect. <laughs> Well, that's all we have for time today. I'm Ryan Chevalier. I'm Siobhan Sullivan. And I'm Ashley Proctor. Thank you for watching Temple Street. We'll see you next time.